welcome. My name is Karen A. And with the help of my power, I am my higher power. I'm here today in Jerusalem, Israel, and connected to the Afro Euro time zone, virtually, literally, spiritually, and in my heart, and all over the world to all of you this morning. Um, I'm proud to present the Radio 12 podcast in our time zone, spreading the words, the lifestyle, and the spirit of recovery through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you would like to share your recovery experience, strength, and hope with our world of recovery fellows um, in our time zone here in the Africa time zone, you could be in touch with me. Or you can go to the RICO 12 website. I will put those details in the chat shortly. If you would like to give a step seven donation, that's also possible. Those help support our Zoom costs and they're payable by uh, PayPal or Venmo. I'll drop that in the chat as well. RICO 12 is an organization with the mission of learning and sharing the similarities of addictions of all kinds and gaining and sharing tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. We come together from all places, faiths, and backgrounds to gain tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. Speakers from our past meetings have represented so many fellowships, addictions, and afflictions, and we look forward to continuing to add to the diversity of speakers and backgrounds. And I, for one, am touched that, that my Two new best friends here, relatively new, Kirsty and Nadia. You know, we all live in different countries. We have different religions, perhaps some similar fellowships. And what we have in common is that we're all parents, specifically mommies, although I'm pretty sure that daddies, siblings, children, uncles, cousins, in-laws can all benefit from this podcast. Today, I present to you a special pop-up panel called The Family Afterwards, Mommies in Recovery. I've prepared a few questions for our wonderful panelists. And uh, with your permission, I'll start with our our newest panelist here on RICO 12 Afro Euro, Kirsty. I'm going to open it up and and let you, well, I'm going to read a passage and let you tackle it first. Okay, one sec. Here we go. I'm reading from page 123. The family afterwards. But the head of the house has spent years in pulling down the structures of business, romance, friendship, health. These things are now ruined or damaged. It will take time to clear away the wreck. Though old buildings will eventually be replaced by finer ones, the new structures will take years to complete father or mother or sister or daughter or, you know, partner knows he is to blame. It will take him many seasons of hard work to be restored financially, but he shouldn't be reproached. Perhaps he will never have much money again, but the wise family will admire him for what he is trying to be rather than what he is trying to get. Now and then, the family will be plagued from specters from the past. For the drinking career, and you can edit replace there, the snorting career, the sleeping around career, the codependent career uh, of any, of almost every alcoholic has been marked by escapades, funny, humiliating, shameful or tragic the first impulse will be to bury these skeletons in a dark closet and padlock the door the family may be possessed by the idea that future happiness is based only on upon forgetfulness of the past we think that such a view is self-centered and in direct conflict with the new way of living okay so Kirsty, what was it like come on open up you know, t- Hi, tell, tell a little naughty one about yourself, the, the skeletons. <laughs> the, <laughs> Hi, Kirsty. Kirsty, very, very grateful addict, recovered addict today. So, do you know, I... Introduce yourself, by the way, sorry, where you're from and all that. 
Fellowship. Oh, I'm from Manchester, Kirsty. Very grateful. Recovered addict, member of CA, AA, and also go to all fellowship big book meetings. Um, was a part of setting Pass It Up Bill's Way Up, which is an all fellowship meeting to any 12 step book people. Um, but what brought me into the rooms was a cocaine addiction. And in that, I ruined my children's childhood. I got lost in a life that was not me, mixed up with people, dangerous situations. And, you know, for a long time, I thought it was a choice. I thought I was the party girl having a good time. But in reality, I was on page 52 for a long time. I was having trouble with personal relations. I couldn't be a mom. I couldn't be helpful to my own children. I didn't take my 10-year-old daughter, nine-year-old at the time, to school most days because I couldn't I couldn't wake up and deal with any kind of life without cocaine. I had serious problems with my heart and was in and out of hospital. My teenage boy was growing up around lads that he looks up to that was like family to him, that was drug dealers going out, stabbing each other. Like, And has he got to them teenage years? And there was, I always thought I hid my drug problem from him, like, and I tried to, do you know, in my, but he grew up into a life and when he was already there, it was overwhelming, overwhelmingly a terrifying place to realise the life I had surrounded my own child with, that I could no longer hide him from the truth. And he also was terrified and seeing how ill I was all the time and how many times I was in and out of hospital and the fear that I filled him with, but the people I surrounded him with. And I was left in this terrifying space where I could not wake up. Well, I didn't normally sleep, so, but I could not do anything without putting this drug inside me. And I'd be crying like I'd be terrified that my heart was going to give up as I was doing it I was terrified the life that I'd put my children in the middle of the people they were surrounded by but there was nothing nothing I tried all my might to stop I even went I went to meetings I did like I tried everything but the one thing I didn't try was this big blue book and God like I was so against having a God in my life but I was so lost in a path that wasn't my path so lost and unfortunately that dragged my children into it like the people that my children was around like suddenly had this heart wrenching like I knew deep deep down inside I knew I did not want my children to grow up and have this life and my child was at this critical age of a teenager where he was like oh, these people are the best people in the world they've got all this money in these nice cars from from selling drugs, from robbing each other, from stabbing each other. And I'd, I'd had my children looking up to these people. like, And I was there. Before I knew it, I was there. It had gone from the party and the fun times to ban my children's in this life. And I was so, so terrified. What was I to do? How was I to stop? I didn't know I couldn't. Today, it's not like that at all. But today, I'll be honest, I have trouble with my teenage boy who what half of him wants I have to be honest with him today I have to be real I have to be direct I have to be accountable mum was going to die mum was very ill these people are not good like I have to be very clear cut with him like his life is so much better today he has clean clothes today he gets fed every single meal time today he gets sent to school on time he has his mum present but my teenage boy liked not having to go to school. He liked not having mum, not letting go out at the times he wanted. So as I'm in but the situation in this difficult situation today is so miles better than that horrible, dreadful, fearful, wanting to die situation I was in before. So today I'm grateful that my teenager shouts at me and doesn't want to go to school. I'm so, so grateful to have I don't really class them as arguments, but I'm grateful to be able to stand there and be like, James, you are going to school. This, well, you didn't use to make me any. Do you know, whatever it is today, I put the right action in, the right action in God's will. I've got God with me no matter what. I do the right things by my child. The outcome, the outcome is God's. I'm not in the business of outcomes. Reality is. I send him out the door to school, he might not make it there. He might get to school and do all sorts of things, terrible things, be cheeky to teachers, get in fights, get in trouble with the police. 
I can still turn up, I'm accountable, I'm real, I'm direct, I'm honest, I put things in place when he does these things, I have the same conversations over and over and over again with him, I try new things, I stop doing things that didn't work, so I put all the right action in, but the outcome, I absolutely, top of page 63, I took a sincere, sincere position to turn my will and life over to God, how sincere is that? My sincere position has to be sincere, it has to be totally sincere as I'm straight back to that world that I was so lost in and so terrified in, and which was destroying not only my life, but my children's life, my family's life. Or I take a sincere position and I have no, no control on the outcome. I didn't sign up for this and get told, God has great outcomes for your child. God said, you know, everything's going to be perfect and you're going to have an A-star student at school and you're going to have no trouble. That's not reality. But I turn my will and life over to God. Sincerely take that position every single day, all day. What I have to do today is put all the right action in. And I don't always get it right, but I ask for guidance. I ask for forgiveness and I do the next right thing. But the outcome with my child, my reality, I don't know any more than what God's got in store for me. I don't know what God's got in store for my son. I don't know what his path is going to look like. But what I do know is if I wake up with the willingness to put the action in to my spiritual program and tap into that power, which is unbelievably miraculous, amazing, that's all I have to do today. I, that's all I have to do. The outcomes are totally out of my hand and I absolutely cannot fight against them. If I fight against reality, like I'm back to where I started, I, I just absolutely have to accept reality. In the, it's hard when it's for your child. I'm not going to say it's easy. Some mornings I don't wake up with the willingness to go and sit in another school meeting or to speak to the police who I've had past history with that I've been on lots of steps forwards and fights today I do that stuff I pr and if I'm not willing I pray for the willingness and I promise my experience is it comes if we earnestly seek God he will come God has got me I am safe and protected no matter the chaos that's going around against me I had an internal problem that I fixed with God so no matter what's going on in my life with my children, with my family, with anything, it can go broader than children, but today we're focusing on children. No matter what's going on with my children, internally, I've got God with me here. So no matter what, I'm Nadia, saying... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you there because I got a bunch of questions for you. Oh, sorry. So I'm interrupting you. I want to introduce, I want to, that's amazing, amazing. And I got a lot of questions for you. So hold, hold, I'm going to pause you for a sec. I want us to introduce... Nadia now, I'd love Nadia, unmute yourself and share with us what it was like for you, the, the skeletons in the past, the grievous mistakes, et cetera, that today you're now sharing with others to help them find their higher power in a path of recovery for a lifetime. Thank you, my beautiful sisters. And thanks for having me back here, Karen. Nadia, a recovered alcoholic and a mom in this program. Oh my gosh, if I didn't have the big book and I didn't have the fellowship. I don't know where we would be, my family, afterwards. I, um, you know, the trail behind me is broken marriages, a broken family. My, my daughter and her brother don't even live on the same continent. You know, we pull the roof down on us. It's what it says there. We pull the roof down. We burn our lives to the ground. Um, Nina, in her first in her first three years of schooling had been to nine different schools, tiny little human being just been shifted all over the place because mom couldn't sit still, restless, irritable, discontent, uh, abusive men, mom being abusive. My gosh, if I have to think about that, you know, that alcoholic anger, it does not stand back for even a mother's instinct to care and protect. Yep. It just, it pales, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't even feature. and. Yeah, the list goes on and on. I mean, it's abuse, it's verbal abuse, it's family separation. I had to keep everyone away from my kids so that they wouldn't tell grandparents and, and fathers and baby daddies what was going on. So the children were living isolated lives. And in the last year, my teenager, well, I, I, I said I said to, to my two sisters that I wouldn't say mine, mine, <laughs> alcoholism, it's mine. Selfish, self-centered, right? That's the root of our troubles. No, the 
one of God's children who's in my home, and um, I'm her mom. She, in the last year, we've had we've had being drunk on street. We've had truancy at school. We've had shoplifting. We've had sorry, baby girl, your your whole inventory has been uh, blurted out here. We've had we've had the entire list of discrepancies that you can think of in one year. And Kirsty, you said it. I say the same thing over and over. I, however, do not have the dubious luxury of getting angry or having the brain, the grouch, the grouch, the brainstorm. I don't get to do that stuff because I'm not like normal people. I come in here and I pray and I ask God to parent my child. Before I go fetch her, I go to pause land, our favorite place, right? We pause at page 86, 87, 88. I get to pause. I stop my car and I say, God, although the great reality is deep down inside, I say, God, you're parenting when I get to that school and I load her in the car. You're talking to her, not me, not me. And and that's what I've been doing. I haven't been getting it right because it's not an overnight matter, this, guys. Remember, we're not saints. We're not saints. But we get to do this together. We get to do this together. And that's the hope. That's the hope. And the the little seed that we're planting here with this mommy podcast is that we can bring hope and we can bring encouragement and we can bring big book solutions to the parents out there not just moms uncles aunts you name it like you said karen thank you yes wow 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 uh my favorite part about what you said oh there's so much uh i think a lot of fellows here on the line uh, can relate to that anger you know cringe when they see a little scar on their child's face from a time that Perhaps they were uh, manhandling them or woman handling them, as the, the mommy case may be. Um, flashbacks to incidents, the alcoholic anger. And I love what you said today. Today, we're not parenting my kid, who's my reputation, who's emblematic of, you know, my success and talent and parenting skills and getting it right. But, um, just raising God's child that he happened to put in uh, in our womb, right? Okay, so we're on to, to the next bit, and thank you all for the beautiful introduction. I'm going to read a little bit more from the family afterwards. This painful past, right? You said the drinking, the truancy, the notes, you know. I got I got a pack of my own, you know, a call from the principal, a call from the the Torah day school, a teenage kid who's got the blues, a teenage daughter's having friend social issues. This painful past. Oh, did I mention talking back? We all have teens. Back talk. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, anyone who has teens is nodding. Anyone who doesn't is just because you don't have them. It's not because you're going to do better than we did. <laughs> right. Talking back, telling you off, except that, you know, teenage starts from two years old these days. This painful past may be of infinite value to other families still struggling with their problem. We think each family has been that has been relieved one day at a time, right? Owes something to those who have not. And when the occasion requires, each member of it should be only too willing to bring former mistakes, no matter how grievous, out of their hiding places. Okay, we did a little bit of that. Cling to the thought that in God's hands, the dark past is the greatest possession you have, the key to life and happiness for others. With it, you can avert death and misery for them. So for me, Karen A. here in Jerusalem, mother of six, Kenai Nahara, without an evil eye, as we say in Yiddish, while I used to be out to lunch, whether it was in OA, thinking about the next uh, oatmeal double chocolate chip cookie bar I was going to have, or after I was widowed, thinking about how I was going to marry Rabbi Tall, Dark, and Handsome, right? I was out to lunch. Today, that past is my greatest asset, and I take my girls to lunch. We go to lunch and get a salad or a falafel, hang out, you know shop for some fun, I don't know, sneakers or whatever, earrings. Instead of being out to lunch, I'm going to lunch. But anyway, we will now hear from Kirsty. 
how is your past your greatest asset today? Maybe a specific example to really crystallize it for the listeners on the line. One, <coughs> Kirsty, I'll do. It's grateful, grateful to be here. So one thing that I share a lot because one thing that really like I struggled with myself for was it's hard to put it into it I loved my kids I've always loved my kids I didn't like being a mum because I wasn't capable but with or without the drug in my body because when I was trying so hard I'd be I couldn't be in the same room as my kids because I wasn't comfortable in my own skin my own children made me irritable restless discontent I didn't enjoy them and it got to the it feels like yeah it sounds so harsh, but like I hated my kids. I didn't want them around me, but it's because I didn't love myself. I hated myself. I didn't know how to be the mum and I knew I was failing them. But I hate to share that, but I share it for any mums that are new, any mums that are coming in and they can't stand to be around their own children. Like, And I didn't know that I was going to love being around them in recovery because you don't know what you don't know. But I like I felt I struggled being around my children with or without a drink or drug in my body like I really really did for a long period in my addiction and it was a dark horrible place and I share that dark horrible truth for any mums that are in that situation where they feel like they can't bear to be around their own children like it doesn't have to be like that this solution like I absolutely I've always loved my children I struggle to be around them like irritable restless discontent at the feeling of my own skin crawling and I think maybe it's because I knew how much I was failing them but I couldn't stand to be in a room with them at times and today I share that for anyone in that situation it doesn't have to be like that today I mean I've got a 10 year old as well as a teenager and we have the best time she's like my best friend we do so much together we go out we watch telly we do each other's nails we talk like the joy I get from just watching her do things and just being present being in the now with her not material things having that now amazing amazing yeah broad highway Nadia how about you? How was your past your greatest asset today? Oh, this is Christy last night when we were hashing this out on our little, you know, on our WhatsApp sessions. And you shared that I had goose flesh running all the way down my body because the alcoholic cannot discern the true from the false. We, I also, when Nina was born, I remember her being given to me. And in we, in our country, we have a game called rugby. I think you guys call it football and it's American football over there. I don't know. Anyway, and and there's a touch pass. So when the ball comes your way and you're 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 a wing, you touch the ball and you flip it behind you. And I literally, that's what I did with my infant when she was given to me for the first time. I touch passed her to her dad. I was terrified because I am driven by 400 forms of madness. One of them is a hundred forms of fear. Fear is the evil and corroding thread, right? I was terrified I was going to kill her, hurt her, because I was the Jekyll and Hyde. I was the sick, sick person. Although I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that I was so spiritually sick. I just thought I was a bad person, a bad mother. And they gave her to me, and I passed her on, and I, I, I have never, just talking about it gets my heart going, right? And I thought, right, this is it. I, I, I missed the cue for salvation. I missed the cue for uh, acceptance from my, you know, all the places that I've looked for acceptance. I just always felt like I was always lost in the cue to the handbook in life. And now I'm lost in the cue to the natural instinct of being a mother. I couldn't even love that child. I took care of her like a task. Tick, 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 medicines, tick, burp, tick, nappy, tick, tick, tick. But no presence, no awareness, like you said, Chris. No heart, because I was up in here all the time, you know, driven by fear, self-pity, resentment. And, oh, man, it's just so detached, so detached. And now in, in recovery, I get to find the presence of God now. I get to find God now. May you find him now. Where my feet are, I don't get it right all the time. I don't get it right all the time. But I've learned bones away and and I was taught in this fellowship I always thought it was sponsees first right I thought because I was like 
sponsoring newcomers like my life depended on it because it does. It does. It, it ensures immunity. But I had my priorities the wrong way around. It's family, jobs. we got to be self-supporting and then the newcomer. And I was doing the newcomers and then job and then family. Now it's my time with my family. I respect and honor those times. That's it. It's for me and them, my mom, my daughter, um, and the phone call that I have with my little boy that's overseas. Uh, that's been the biggest challenge, I can tell you. I just thought I was an evil human being. I thought I was an evil human being, and it was better that the kids were with their dads because I was it was inca- I was incapable. You know, I was absolutely incapable of loving myself, let alone another human being. And it's in this program that I get to have relationship with God, and I get to have it with Him through you guys, and now with my child. Well, this child of God that's in my house. <laughs> what a blessing! Yeah, I love what you're saying, and what the big book that I'm hearing resonating in what you just said, Nadia, is a price had to be paid, right? I can't be a workaholic like my coworkers because I need to be at home to serve lunch, not just to make it. I love what you said about ticking stuff off because I could also be a little bit of a, a duaholic, a workaholic, you know. Okay, I made lunch, check. I did the laundry, check. But then how much nobody loves me? Well, there's nobody there. You're just a machine. Why is every tweet you like a machine? Because you are one, you know? Um, price had to be paid, you know? I won't take a full-time job. I'll work 70% hours. Up front. Only go in the office three days a week. A price had to be paid, you know? We alcoholics can't work like other people. We can't think like other people. We certainly can't mother like other people. You know, I can't just lose it. I can't get angry. I can't um, be controlling, you know? So we're talking about what it was like and how it's changed. Um, Kirsty. Take us into a deep dive into a little bit of your your big book parenting. Where do you use your big book daily or when it gets tough? You know, answer the question as you will. Take us into oh. the big book passages you cling tightest to in your parenting. I love the pause land and especially where it says a pause because there's lots of good times with my children as well now, today. <laughs> and pause when I'm excited excitement less danger and the first word is excitement excitement for an alcoholic mind can be a dangerous place and I can run off in self-will and make crazy decisions which later so do you know I have to pause pause land even when excited agitated but whatever I have to pause I have to plug into that God for guidance always and another line I love our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness this is not an overnight matter as I've described like I didn't know how to be a parent I have to grow in understanding and effectiveness in all areas of my life I have to grow in understanding and effectiveness on how to be a parent I have to grow in understanding and effectiveness on how to live a spiritual way of life in all my activities so I love So what I really have, what I have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance or growth. I like to change that word for growth of our spiritual, of my spiritual condition. Every day, every day, every minute of every day is a day, minute when we must carry the vision of God's will into all, all of my activities. Well, Like Nadia just said, my first, my main activity is parenting. So I have to bring God's will into that every day, all day, every minute. How can I best serve thee? So for an example, when I go to like parenting meetings at school or my son's in trouble with the police or, and what I have learned is these people are very willing to work work with me when I'm willing to work with them. So these people, I I see things from a totally different pair of eyes today. So I go to the situations thinking, what, how can I be helpful? Is this helpful? Is this useful? Is this helpful? Is this useful? God, 
Is this helpful? Is this useful? God, channel through me to be useful, to be helpful. Like, I don't know how to be a parent. I don't know how to, how to be a child of God. Like, I'm learning. I'm so new to all this. So I remind myself all day, my next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And how do I do that? With the clear cut directions in this book. Pause at anything, everything, pause. I check myself, I do exactly what it says, I watch for resentment, anger, fear, I disregard the other person totally, even when it's my own child, I look at my part, I pray away, I cannot remove what blocks me, when I go into them school meetings, if I go in with false pride, which I, you know, is up there for me, irresponsibility, not getting there on time, not putting other stuff before it. If I go in with them things, I am blocked from this power. So I have to absolutely have to work my step tens all day, every day to unblock. I can't remove that false pride of I'm the best parent ever. When I, I have to ask for God's help. I have to take God with me in all my activities. My main activity being, being a parent. So that, like, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Well, it doesn't just answer my question. I happen to have a PTA today, a parent teacher conference for my 12 year old and uh, for my my youngest, my eight year old is a, a slightly hard of hearing. So I, 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 it's like, as you say that, I'm like hmm, I'm working with this school psychologist and the occupational therapist and her um her aides, her corrective teachers to help her, you know, uh, integrate and all that. And I, I saw that I, as you said that, I was like, I threw a little bit of self-will into that email yesterday. Like today, when I go into PTA, I got to do God's will. Like Kirsty said, I got to ask for his will here. I got to go in with humility. Humility. How can I help raise God's child to be a fine human being, to be helpful to the human race, to be of service to God and his creatures? Amazing. So you not only answered my question, but you really helped me on a personal level. And I'm sure many women, men and others who are on here, Nadia, would you like to take a, a crack at that question? What, where you kind of hold on tight certain passages of the big book day to day or when it gets hairy or, or both? First of all, I just want to say I'm having the time of my life. You do not have to ask me to dive into this magic book. You don't have to ask me twice. You're, you're 20,000 leagues under the sea. Right? <laughs> oh my God, I love this book. All right, so so there's a couple of instructions, okay, that I follow. Like I need paint by numbers. I need, like the book, you said it, curse, clear cut instructions. Tell me, you do this, then we ask, then this happens. Easy peasy, right? It's a recipe. So it says here, one of the instructions is the grouch and the brainstorm. I said it now on page 66, the third paragraph. The grouch and the brainstorm are the dubious luxury of normal men. Okay, we spoke about that. Then the other thing, the other instruction that I have here, page 98, the fourth paragraph at the bottom, argument and fault finding are to be avoided like the plague. Bill makes no bones about death threats and he, he don't make no bones, right? He, like the plague. So what happened for me was when I enlarged my spiritual life, because I've been in this program a long time, bouncing in, bouncing out, not reading, not following, not listening, doing it my way. And when I did four to nine, the men's process towards schools and my old ideas towards schools and teachers and PTAs and syllabus and curriculums and came to the fore. Now I can't fix it. People like us, we, may, I don't know. I'm not going to get into outside issues, but, but part of my men's process is going to the school. And I go there a lot, like you heard, is to go with a helpful spirit because that's my purpose. It's my purpose. My brother Terry F said the two most important days of his life, his birthday and the day he found out why. Love you, my brother. And and that's the thing. We're here to be of maximum service to all God's kids. And, you know, I am also reminded that any life run on self will can hardly be a success. There are some sick people in the school system. There are. So we work on our other team program. We're bringing that into the school. We get some community project service 
projects going, not just me, not just me doing service to the newcomer. I go outside into my community and I go be helpful there and I go take the kids, I blow, shop, blow them into the car and we go do some cool things in and around our community. And we have the, 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 the opportunity to do those things. It's so powerful. And then because we were doing this exercise and I was diving, diving, diving into my beloved pages, I needed to know what to say when it gets crazy in my house. Because it gets crazy. I forget to pause. I forget I've got step 10 accountability buddies. Karen, I love you, darling. I forget these things. And so here's an instruction. Bill tells us what to say. Page one, one, one. First paragraph. Well, I didn't hold the place. Hold on. It says here. What did he say? What to say? Page 118. I apologize. 118. First paragraph. Here it is. This is what we say. Here's our script. This is getting serious. Everyone's going cray cray in the house. Nina's shouting. I'm running away. Then I'm shouting. Then she's running. Yeah. And then when she gets quiet because she's had enough, then I'm like, don't you have anything to say? You know, she's like crazy. And it's going crazy. So pause. If I can remember, here's the script. Page 118. This is getting serious. I'm sorry I got disturbed. We make amends immediately, right? Step 10. Let's talk about it later. Pause land. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. This is getting serious. Right. What is that? What is that? Maybe, maybe you two could help me out. You know, we addicts are undisciplined. I wish I could do paid by numbers. I'm I'm a, I'm not much of a instruction follower because we addicts are undisciplined particularly this one i would just paint my hair and my outfit and then go buy a new one uh so i let god discipline me right um and not do anything silly like try to paint or compulsively overspend which i'm really good at um this is getting serious i would say that for myself this has been one of the most major parts of this round of recovery i've been in these rooms for 10 years oa coda now that you know spiritual gangsters the rico 12 community for all fellowships all addictions all afflictions this i would say you know it's no bright light spiritual experience but it's like when my 16 year old is going ballistic because she wants a new phone or ballistic because her younger sister's sitting on her bed or some dumb thing like that I take myself out, you know, or another one of my teens was kind of, kind of being belligerent, like talking down to me the other day. And I was like, this, you know, it's not exactly what, what the big book says, but I said, this doesn't feel good. I'm going to be going to sleep now. And you know what? That was an amazing thing to do. Just shutting my mouth, realizing that this is getting serious, taking myself out of the game and waking up, you know? doing a 10, 11, and 12, right? That was getting serious. I was getting resentful. Bye-bye. And I'm tired, right? The big book talks about being hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. I'm tired and you're being rude. I'm going to go to bed, do a step 10, whether written or verbally with God. And then that takes us to our first question. I'm going to, I'm going to tackle some of our beautiful questions in the Q&A so we don't run out of time. And then we come to the morning, rise and shine. We have a great question here from Christy about the morning. Okay, uh, Christy, you first again. How do you fit upon awakening into busy mornings with young kids, making lunches, school runs, et cetera? Great question. You know, that's a great question, Kirsty. Very, very grateful at it. Did you know, before I was very fortunate and so grateful I ended up going to a treatment center which was a 12-step center which taught big book I just want to add that bit but before that I tried the program and I used to say the same thing how can I possibly fit it in how can I do this do I? and do you know what I learn I absolutely have to I have to fit it in so that is part of having the willingness so the three things that are indispensable are willingness honesty and open-mindedness like and I used to have like every excuse under the sun and I have two children and you know one of them is very very difficult to not do that morning routine but today 
I like I wake up and I do it no matter what because without that discipline and without getting tapped into that power and today one thing I will say is I enjoy it I love it I couldn't possibly miss an awakening and this morning I've had the most chaotic morning I was telling Karen and Nadia when I got on here my son, I said, we've nearly had a live show of my parenting because he was refusing to go to school. But before I even go and speak to him, before I even deal with my children, I get up earlier and I connect with that God. I do my prayers, I do my meditation. And, I, you know, I improve that conscious contact with God as soon as my eyes open. But today... I wake up with the willingness most days to do that. It, that fills my heart with joy. I have to plug into God. I have to bring God into my life today. Today, it never feels like I haven't got time. Previously, it always felt like I didn't have time. And I feel like what got me there was I did it when I didn't have the willingness. I prayed for the willingness. I got on my hands and knees and I meditated and I just shut everything else off in my life to do this to get the time until I got to that space where today I love doing it but at the beginning it wasn't always like that so to answer the question to I'm trying to remember back to when I used to not have the time but I feel like pray for the willingness to have the time get up at 5 a.m 4 a.m 3 a.m if I have to because without having that time like I don't have life I don't have life without if I put my children getting up, you say I do wake up late, which has happened to me once, only once, you know, recently. Today I'm disciplined, I go to bed on time, I get like, I have routine in my life today, which is something I've ever had. But I did actually get up, funnily enough, it's just come to my initiative thought. I got up late one day last week my, and I was like, oh my gosh, do you know, I still did my half an hour routine before I went and got the kids up. Today, I don't panic. Life shows up. If I'm late, I'm late. They still wasn't late for school because I have a routine to allow for things like that. I have discipline in my life today. My kids have routine. And, you know, it's not always smooth in the morning like I just shared my morning with chaotic. But before my morning was chaotic, my alarm goes off very early. I get up, I plug in because I absolutely have to. And my advice would be we start step 11 at night when we retire, review that day, pray before I go to bed. God, I do it every night. I'm so grateful for today, God. Thank you. Please give me the same willingness tomorrow, God. Please, because that's what I'm so grateful for every day. Today, I've got the power of choice, which I never had before. I, I've got the power of choice whether to plug into my spiritual program of action, action or not. So I pray every night when I do, we retire, step 11, nightly review with God. Please, God, give me the same willingness tomorrow to wake up and plug in. And that's what I'm grateful for every morning when I wake up, that I've got the willingness. Because I, willingness, I feel, should be slash action. I yeah, have to have well, you read my mind. You read my mind. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. a program of action, right? Because we're hearing her say a lot of action in here, right? We're praying for the willingness. We're asking God to help us. We're asking him to discipline us. And we got to have a plan, right? We got to make lunches at night instead of the morning if we're late. We got to wake up at 6.30 instead of 6.45 if we're habitually late, like yours truly, right? We got to make some action. We got to make some changes, right? Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was. I think I was finishing up on that. I pray, but it's, you know, it's praying for the willingness, praying for the guidance. But the the bottom line is, this isn't a program for people that want it because I wanted it, but I couldn't get it. I didn't know how to. It's not a program for people that need it because I desperately needed it. It's a program for people that do it. It's a do program, action, 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 making time. Have to absolutely no other choice. If I do it, I get it, and what I get is so much more incredible than I could have ever possibly even imagined but I have to do it it's a do 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 amazing right remember we're, we're totally spiritual and then there's a big fat chapter called into action we don't just pray we don't just wait for a miracle and that's one of the beautiful paradoxes of these books is that we're constantly praying and we're also constantly doing and that doing again paradoxically is sometimes doing nothing shutting up praying, not responding, you know, this is getting serious, taking ourselves out, out of the game. Amazing, amazing. Okay, let's see, we're with time, we're still good. 
Um, Nadia, talk about your morning routine, maybe, you know, what time you wake up, how you go through it. I think you have a teenager, you don't maybe have as little ones uh, around uh, like we do, but talk about your morning routine. I know, I know for myself, it's, um, it's up there with oxygen and water. <laughs> like if I don't do it, I feel like my, my, my morning is, is wonky. I think, as they say in the UK, like I'm just off. So I have to pray or I have, you know, if I'm running late, I pray a shorter version. And if I'm really late, it's like, okay, God, this, you got this. Like, I, I just need you to help me. Like, get, get me through. Let me not yell at anybody. Let me not, you know, pull any ponytails. <laughs> Let me smile when I say goodbye. Okay. Go for it, Nadia. Uh, just everything you, you both have said, like on the mornings that I can't, because of course I had little Alex here with me and he was like an early riser way beyond any alarm that I'd ever set. Okay. So I would just wake up with him and I'd be like, God, like you just said, you got me till I can get to you. Like, I'm going to get to you when Alex is settled. I'm going to get to you, but just keep me till then, right? Safe and protected. We're just so safe and protected. Alcoholics, we can go anywhere. We can do anything that, norm, you know, that alcoholics, we think we can't. We can even wake up some mornings and not do this, but I am a fish out of water if I don't do my upon awakening. I'm a fish out of water. The world is in trouble. I'm in trouble. It's World War Three. Sorry, guys. That's it's just it's it goes nuts. So I tried it. I did try not practicing my disciplines of step 10 in the morning on awakening when we retire. And it didn't end well. OK, because I'm I'm my life is unmanageable. Class, the second part of step one. So my alarm is set at four every morning. I'm not bragging. It's just that our time schedule starts at six. So I'm up at four, I'm connecting, I'm deep, I'm I'm in God, and I've got a couple of things that I do. There's journaling, big book study. Anyway, it the, the, this I need to tap. I need to tap into that power. It's inside of me. I've got to tap into it, and then I can re greet the world, and then I can be there for the rest of the world and not kill anybody, whether I'm physically doing it or in my mind. Hey. <laughs> Because I've got some serious assassination plots <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> oh my, oh my. I see a blockbuster Hollywood film on the horizon. Um, Tell it me. <laughs> or whatever the South African just, uh, movie industry is, right? Just one more, one more thing. One yeah. more thing because it's a program of action. I set an alarm three times a day to pause and pray and obsess about gratitude. The alarm goes off. I get up. I go to the toilet. I've done worse things on my knees in a bathroom. Trust me. And I pray. <laughs> and I pray and I pause and I obsess in gratitude. And I go back to greet the world again. Because my 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 spiritual fitness, that's that's it. I've got a daily reprieve. But for me, <laughs> I've uh, it's a couple of hours for me. And then I start running back on or orange battery. Wow. Thanks. You are amazing. You are just, you're, you're actually like so disciplined or you really let God discipline you. But I also want to say something for those of us who might be, you know, I've heard a lot of sponsees say they're ADHD or neurodiverse or whatever the term du jour is. Um, and I'm like a little bit, you know, I got a lot going on. I work, a, I work a pretty big job. I'm active in my community. I'm active in recovery, you know, um, got a lot going on. I exercise regularly. And uh, I just want to say for those of you who are still a little less organized or still letting God discipline them, look out for the opportunities he sends your way, right? I'll give you an example. The other day, there's a woman who's sick with a dreaded disease. I think she's already had, uh, you know, unfortunately, one of her, uh, one of her breasts removed and, and she's now, um, you know, fully in bed with a caretaker. And, and someone sent me a WhatsApp saying, hey, did you have some connection to uh to Mrs. N? Because we need visitors. And I was like, boom, that's where God wants me. That's my service opportunity. So if you're a little bit hyperactive, like yours truly, and like you don't have it, you know, scheduled down to a T, keep your eyes open because God will send stuff your way every day if you open your heart and open your eyes and ears. And you can, and you can pick up those, beautiful service opportunities you know it's like i had a sponsor sitting at a wedding thinking about whatever karen your audio is not great okay i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in one i'm sure she's gonna sort out her audio there's a question here from uh 
I uh, can't see. Only oh, Nicola B. Thank you. I relate with what Nadia said about passing on that. I wouldn't hold my baby and I didn't feel worthy. I didn't feel loved. Do you find that you overcompensate? Oh, yes, I did. You know, because I, I run on self law often and I go live in column four again in my defects, in my self pity, in my fears. But but I remember a piece in the, in the big book as God's people, we are no longer servile or scraping. I don't scrape to that anymore i'm doing what i can i'm living deep in this program i love this program my life oh thank god for aa thank god for the big book as god's people we are not servile or scraping i just i hold on to that i hold on to that instruction curse there's another question there by brandy do you want to jump in sis yes so the question is how much do you share with your kids about your addiction and recovery how and then i think it's oh We'll go one question at a time, should we, Nadia? So how much do you share? So me personally, Kirsty, very grateful. I did <laughs> recovered for today. I share everything with them. So they know fully because I live an honest, open life. Um, and I see, like we said before, my dad passed my greatest asset. So I try and let my children learn from my mistakes, start trying. And to be honest, my teenage boy, he knew, he knew that I was a drug addict. He knew that I was nearly dying. He seen me in states. He seen the life I was in. I had no option but to be honest both my children knew where I went when I went to a treatment center and I'm not saying there's any right or wrong or for me I live an honest real life today I, I couldn't this is a design for living I had my children as well I don't know whether this made my journey easier the dad is in the fellowship he's been in the fellowship for six years he'd also gone on a journey and gone to a treatment center and my kids knew that he was alcoholic, the new dad can't drink, the new, I mean, my little girl's only 10, but she knows I don't hide it from her, like, mum did some wrong things in the past, like, today I don't act like that, mum was very, very ill, like, but then again, I wouldn't put my fear of drink on my kids, like, because my kids will grow up, they might be able to drink like normal people, I'm very real about it, very honest about it, very open about it, um, and always trying, you know, the positives of it to my children. Like, how can my children learn and grow from this? How can I, like, grow? Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. Is it effective to hide half my life, my life, my whole life? Like, I am an addict. That is me. Like, it, my children, there's a strong bond with my children today. How could I, how could I not? That's just my experience. I have worked with ladies that don't tell the children and I feel like a lot of people don't feel ready to and it might, you know, prey on it. God's guidance, my children know the, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I'm going to jump uh, in there too. Is that cool? Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. We're, we're going to wind down though. We have, uh, we have to wind down in three minutes, but please go ahead and answer and then I'll. Page 15. We'll my wife and I abandoned ourselves with enthusiasm to the idea of helping other alcoholics to a solution of their problem. My home is full with big book studies, online workshops. Everyone's here and we're just, it's just, it's a house. It's, we, they, they just hear. And Nina hears the language and Alexander has heard the language and they walked in and out of the meetings. They hear it. They hear it. We speak about it. We it's a program of rigorous honesty. Nina, the other day, just quickly to end off, she they at school they had a little circle in the bus shelter. It was raining, and they were having an AA meeting. The kids were introducing themselves as alcoholics, and telling a quick little short story. Obviously, it was hysterical and was very below the belt. The swear words, you know, but right, they're going to know where the door is. If that's their affliction, they're going to know where the door is. Absolutely, I share it. I share it all. Wow. Um, just to counteract you all, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, my kids know I'm in addiction, I'm in recovery. Um, I don't share everything, actually. Um, I try to, that, you know, they know, they know that I work a program for being off flour and sugar. That's just like a, an alcoholic or a drug addict, you know, tell them just like the home. Oh, we've lost you again, Karen. What do you think, Nadia? Should we close up or? 
Yeah, so thank you everyone for coming today. There's lots of information on Recall 12, which is in the chat. We're so, so grateful for all of you being here today and so grateful. And you know what I love about the serenity prayer? I always say, accept the people I cannot change, including my children. Have the courage to change the people I can. The only people I can change is me. <laughs> like I'll say that to myself all day regarding my children and the wisdom to know that, to know that today. But thank you everybody for making it today. And we'll pray out together with the wee version of the serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thy will be done, not I. Amen. the side of his mouth and he wanted to scream but the sound never came out so he reached for the bottle to wash the pain away cause what he wanted so badly was to
die.